Who can I? To the audience here? Uh, even though he's a man who does not need an introduction, still we will give him one. So he is the James O'Connor Distinguished Professor of Decision and Game Sciences at Northwestern University. He's also been the founding director of the Kellogg Center for Game Theory, founding editor of Games and Economic Behavior, and a co-founder of the Game Theory Society. And there's a long list, but I won't take up all this time, just Good. list all the great accomplishments. So take it away. Anyway. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank the organizers and uh, all of you who came. Uh, we all agree that this is a wonderful series that, uh, that's an advantage of the coronavirus, that we can have such a nice series. Uh, so I'll try to match the previous wonderful lectures. I want to talk about viable Nash equilibria, formation and defection. And below this, you have some contact information if you want more details. Uh, I'm motivated by the fact that there is a lot of discussions around where I am about the um, usefulness of theory because uh, the game theory and the economic theory in general have been losing a lot of credibility in the economic world in abroad. And I think that a lot of it is that much of the applications and papers that are used make use of very non-credible Nash equilibria. And maybe one way to control it is when we do applications is to restrict ourselves to only Nash equilibrium equilibria that are viable. So to discuss viability, I want to start this direction by discussing two indices that are helpful for this. A formation index, which broadly speaking is the number of players that can form the equilibrium pi and a defection index D of pi is the number of defectors that pi can sustain. What is this, was to me was surprising and very nice to know is that these two simple indices, they succeed in predicting the performance of Nash equilibrium in social system and in lab and field experiments. So in other words, they assess viability as it really is in real life. They also uncover some new basic pro pro properties of Nash equilibrium that have eluded game theory refinements and I'll show the differences as we go. But I'm mostly excited by the fact that there is a tool here to assess viability of Nash equilibrium. And for this reason, most of my lecture will be focused not so much on theorems, but on examples because how do I illustrate that something assesses viability? I look at examples and I see in the examples that the, the way I assess viability using these indices conf um, is in accordance with what we observe in reality. So I could say that the broader goal of this research is to develop theoretical tools to answer behavioral questions where you can say that's what game theory is all about. So what's new here? Well, I want to do it in a more immediate way. So let me take an analogy from the theory of investment. So when I go to, when I, the first time I went to my investment consultant, he, he and I would discuss some investment X. And the first thing he told me is the expected value in the standard deviation of X, for real. I mean, I had to tell him that he, don't, he doesn't have to explain to me, but this was very useful, even though expected value and standard deviation of X might not have been exactly what I needed, but as a crude measures, <coughs> they were very helpful in order to assess the viability of X. So I think that people who are involved in play of equilibrium, either players in the game or policy makers that count on people playing the game or people who have interest in the outcome of the game, they should be interested in the viability of an equilibrium pi and F of pi and D of pi are crude measures that help us assess the viability of pi. Uh, there are some limitations of my approach or advantages. I don't know what to take, how to say it. Uh, I took simple minimal departure from the Nash view. Uh, I'll tell you why. And that means in particular that I stay with defections that are anonymous and ordinal. So I don't, like Nash, who doesn't care who in the game as the incentive to defect as long as they don't and it doesn't care about whether they 
benefit a lot or a little from defection. He just wants it to be a best reply. I do the same thing. My view of defections will be anonymous and ordinal. The only difference I will take from the Nash view is that instead of taking the assumptions that no opponents of mine defect, I'm going to introduce a variable which will be the number of potential opponents with defect. So this opens up the discussion and all the new observations that I will discuss can be attributed to this one change therefore. So it's good to keep one change. It has other advantages. Uh, by not going into game theory refinements, which would be, it was very tempting when you talk about what I'm going to talk about, uh, I avoid many of the pitfalls that were involved in the game theory refinement literature. Uh, as you remember, game theory refinements were not all uh, uniform. They were on different refinements, were used for different games. Uh, and the best response computations could be quite complex, exceeding the computational complexity of even very rational players. So I'm gonna stay away from this to keep these advantages, but I will talk about possible other approaches later in the talk when we have time. Uh, earlier work to this on the theoretical side, I didn't know it at first, but it's true that uh, the level D of pi, the level of the, the, the index of the defection index of pi can be viewed as a level of subgame perfection as measured in a paper I had with Neme. Moreover, in applications, uh, the D measure originated in the literature on distributive computing in computer science, where you want several computers to be engaged in a computation task, and you are concerned that. Uh, if some of the computers fails, the overall computation task would fail. So this literature was trying to deal with that. Uh, Elias in 2002 recognized that this is a implementation, implementation problem and he generalized the whole approach to implementation theory. And if we have time, I'll mention it or describe it. Uh, and he has an implementation theory with faulty players instead of faulty computers. The index F that I discuss here hasn't been mentioned before to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do in this paper is present theory and applications of significantly more extensive properties of D beyond the ones that in the implementation theory and also impl impl implication of the new index F. So my overall game theory story, just to uh, help you think through this, is that I have rational players who are about to play an equilibrium pi, but they are concerned about defections by opponents, unlike Nash equilibrium. And this actually came up in many times when I was teaching Nash equilibrium to my executive students, because I would define the Nash equilibrium they buy the idea that everybody optimizes and then as I keep doing examples, they keep raising their hands and say, oh, you mean I should assume that all my opponents are playing the equilibrium? I said, yes, you should assume that and I'm trying to justify it, but it's very hard to justify this total trust that all my opponents are going to play the equilibrium. And there are many reasons why opponents may not play my, the equilibrium. So for example, as in Elias's paper, the opponents may be irrational and unpredictable. Also, unlike Nash equilibrium, coalitions of rational defectors may defect by cooper cooperating, as we know in some solution concept like coalition proof equilibrium. Uh, and there may be incomplete game specification. So maybe some of the players are threatened or bribed, or maybe they are playing this game to create reputation for future games, and there are all kinds of things of this type that maybe were not specified in the payoffs of the game under considerations. So I should anticipate that maybe the game that I wrote down is not perfect, and for whatever reasons, player may act differently, and I want to take it into account. And for this reason, I'm going to say that the strategy is highly stable if it is dominant against many such defections. Uh, so those of you who deal with the incomplete information know that if I'm not sure about what my opponents will do, I can put a prior over all the possibilities and then take best response to that. 
but another approach is to use a strategy which is a dominant strategy. If I use a strategy which is dominant strategy, I don't have to worry about what my opponents do. Well, both of advantages and disadvantages. The dominant strategy is a strong condition, but I'm going to show you the dominant against many defections is actually observed in more, many social systems. Mm -hmm. So the fact that it's a very demanding condition is not a problem in much of reality. Uh, the advantage of it is that it's much more manageable than if, if I have to put a prior probability about all these kind of defections, that's very difficult and not very credible. So on the other hand, now I'd say that high viability is a strong, reliable property because of this dominance property, which means that low viability is a not so credible because it just indicates inability to, the, to satisfy such strong conditions doesn't rule it out if it doesn't satisfy such strong conditions. So I would count more on the high viability, the low viability has to be furtherly tested. Okay, so what I want to do now, I want to give you the definitions and some properties, then I'm going to show you uh, why this helps, this, pro this, no this indices help to assess viability assessment. I'm going to show you some observation from behavioral economics that will indicate why I say that this is a good measure. These are good me measures. I'll show you an incomplete information game, and then I'm going to compare it with standard refinements from game theory and show you that it really captures something new and different than the standard refinements. Then I have a bunch of other observations and topics, time permitting. I'd like to speak a little bit about future research and some open problems that maybe some of you can help help me with. And I have a proposed experiment, if any experimenters in the, are in the audience would like to know about that. So let me start with the definition. So I'm going to look at a fixed strategy profile of an n-person strategic game, Gamma. And I'm going to define the defection index of pi to be the minimal number of defections from pi that are needed to construct a pi prime near pi to which pi is not the best response. How many defections does it take to ruin the best response property of pi? The minimal number that will ruin it. And that will be the defection index. That'd be one way to look at the defection index. If you look at it this way, you can see the D of pi measures the confidence in individual strategies. Because with any number of defections less than pi, we get to a pi prime to which pi is still a best response. So with any number of defections less than pi, everybody's pi i is still optimal. The defectors or the non-defectors. So it's a meaningful measures in this way. It gives me a measure of how confident I am each player is in his strategy because uh, because uh, if the number of defectors doesn't exist D and if D is large, then we are very confident that we are playing the right strategies. Equivalent definition to this, and that's actually the one I started with, but a little more difficult to say, uh, is one that uh, Abraham et al. called resilience in their 2006 paper. It's the, it's the maximal number of it players, D, such that Pi deters D potential defectors, and I have to explain it. Let's look first at the summary here. Nash says that any uh, Nash equilibrium, any profile, which is Nash equilibrium, if no single player has incentive to defect. Any individual defectors, assuming that everybody else stays where they are, is a loss. Then it's, if it's, is, then, so you don't want to defect. If you defect, it's a loss, and then it's not Nash equilibrium. I want to say that pi deters defection by groups of defectors, uh, pi, and I'm going to say it strongly, and this is what I mean here. So pi deters the potential defectors in a strong sense means the following. 
if you look at any sub game that is played by D players, these are the potential defectors in my mind, and the group is G, assuming the players outside of G are staying with the equilibrium strategies, pi, for any, for any member of this potentially defecting group, his or her pi is a dominant strategy equilibrium in this defection game. And that's what I mean by strongly deterred. So if Sylvan and I and Bob decided to defect, well, do I want to defect or not? It depends what the other two are doing. Defection is a, is a game when it's multiplayer defection. So if I want to defect, depends what the other players are doing. So I'm staying strongly, it's strongly deterred. If no matter what the other two do, I would lose by defecting, weakly lose. No matter what the others do, I would lose by defecting. So in that sense, it's strongly deter, defect, deter, de, de, defection. In the case of Nash, when you talk about one player defection, this issue doesn't come up. But when you talk about multiplayer defections, the issue has to be addressed because you have to make some assumption how you view your defection. So I'm saying strongly deter defections because of this uh, definition. What do you mean uh, by what do you mean by sub game? By sub game, I mean that the players. Thank you for asking. The players in G are going to play the same game, assuming that the players outside of G are all fixed at their equilibrium strategies. So it's the game played by the restricted subset of players, assuming. Yeah. So it's more a restricted game than the sub game. There is no extensive form, nothing like this. No, no, exactly. I didn't, I, I don't, reluctant to use the word subgame. It's so overly used, but that's exactly what it, what it is. Yes. Okay. But generically, a Nash equilibria has a D of P equals one. No? Uh, well, I don't know what you mean by generically, but Nash equilibrium. I'll, 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 I'll answer this very substantially in, in a moment. I'll give much more detailed answer. Uh, but let me go to the definition of F, and it's a dual definition. It's really nothing new in terms of the condition, but it's very interesting for applications. So take the same definition I just had, which said that none of the players would want to defect as long as the players outside the coalition are fixing their pie. Let me turn it around and say the players outside the coalition play pie makes it a dominant strategy for all the players in the group to play pi. That's exactly the conditions we just talked about, except that I'm starting with the players outside of pi. So it's the same condition. I'm just saying the players outside should be L of them. And it says therefore that any L such number, any F loyalist strongly induce the play of pi on the rest. It's the same condition just sta sta stated through the number of loyalists, the complementary number. So it's the same condition, except that if you look at it, it has a, all a different view of what it says. It says that if you can get F people to play the equilibrium, you would make everybody else join. It'll be a dominant strategy for them to join. So it has the flavor of formation rather than defection. And in that sense, it's dual. So that's why D of F plus D of pi plus f of pi equals n. And I named them both because there is, why would, would I want to name the, sa the same condition stated differently in different names? Because you'll see that in different applications, they each make sense on their own and they're each useful on their own. Uh, there are three other conditions I'm not gonna discuss here, but they're very interesting and I'll be happy to come back to them later. But here is an answer to Sylvan, your question. So I can partition all the strategy. So let's look at n-person games. Let's fix n, let's look at n-person games. And look, let's look at all the equilibria I can generate in n-person game. I can partition them, as you see here, with equilibrium with d of pi equals zero, equilibrium with d of pi equals one, equilibrium with d of pi equals two, up to equilibrium of, with d of pi equals n. And there is very natural interpreta interpretations to this. If it's pi, d of pi equals zero, then pi is not even a dominant strategy. It's not even a Nash 
equilibrium because meant to destroy the equilibrium, I need no zero defections will already destroy the best reply of property. But if you go from one on, it captures all the Nash equilibrium, except that Nash only wants one, but sometimes it deters two defectors and sometimes it defers three detectors and so on. So there is kind of an increasing level of uh, defection deterrence. So I have D of pi equals one pi deters single player defection, but not more, it's not that strong. Stronger condition is the equilibria pi that are, they deter up to two defectors, but not more. They deter also by monotonicity one player defectors and so on. And you go on like this and dominant strategy equilibria, they deter any number of defectors. So we get this nice hierarchy of Nash equilibria going up. Uh, similarly, we get, you can come down the ladder D of pi equals n is dominant strategy equilibrium. D of pi equals n minus one means that pi is a dominant strategy equilibrium conditional on having one loyalist. And that I have to explain, but uh, there is a very natural explanation. I can give you examples. D of pi equals n minus two. It's a dominant strategy equilibrium conditional on having two players playing the equilibrium and so on. And you can come down the ladder all the way down. So this is the dual view. Do you start from dominance and come down or do you come start from deterrence and go up? Uh, I find it to be kind of entertaining in one way. I, I, uh, I remember a conversation with Shapley. Shapley always hated Nash equilibrium, but he was accepting of dominant strategy equilibrium. And I could, I could see why, but now that I have this ladder, I don't know there is a, such a big difference, right? <laughs> where, where does the Nash stop being bad? And when does it, dominance is acceptable if it's really a continuum, a progression of concept, if the concept is just a progression of ideas and at some level it becomes dominant. Okay, so this, uh, let me give you an example of the computations in a simple, small asymmetric games because my examples after that will all be large. So let me look at the party line game. So this, a lot of my examples will be political in the US. So I have three Democrats and five Republicans. Each has to choose one of two languages, English or French. And here is their preferences or their payoffs. Every player wants to mismatch the choices of the opposite party. It, a Democrat doesn't want to look like a Republican, so if he wants to choose the language that the fewest of the Republicans chose, and conversely for the Republicans. Here is a very natural inter equilibrium here. I'll call it the divisive equilibrium. It's an equilibrium we see now in the US. All the Democrats choose French, and all of the Republicans choose English. Now everybody is doing their best. It's actually Pareto efficient. Uh, so this is a divisive equilibrium. How sustainable is it? What is the D index of this equilibrium just to illustrate? I say that the D index of the divisive equilibrium is two. Why is that? If I want to destroy the best response property of the divisive equilibrium, two Democrats switching to French will make it a dominant strategy for every Republican to switch, I'm sorry, two Democrats switching to English will make it a dominant strategy for every Republican to switch to French because the majority of the Democrats then are speaking English. So two Democrats can destroy the best response property. Similarly, three Republicans can destroy the best response property of a Democrat. So the minimal number of players needed to destroy the equilibrium is two. Formation of the equilibrium, the formation index by the duality is eight minus two is six. Or you can look at it directly, which is more difficult, but I want to argue that any group of six players can form the divisive equilibrium, 
but groups that consist of only five players do not. And that would mean that the, the formation index is six. It takes six people to make it a dominant strategy for everybody else to join the equilibrium. Okay, let me now show you some more examples that will show you why I'm calling it subjective viability assessments. Uh, and let me show you some examples. So again, these are, well, some are political. So let me first look at why the, the, why the D index assesses sustainability. I want to show you one example, the first example where uh, I would claim the equilibrium is highly sustainable because the D index is high and contrast it with an equilibrium which I would say is unsustainable because the D index is low. And I hope that this will give you an understanding why I say that it assesses viability. Oops. So for high sustainability, let's look at a very equil familiar equilibrium. Suppose we all get up in the morning, we turn our computer, 200 million computer users and the computer flashes and makes them choose a language. And everybody wants to choose a language and let's say they're all geniuses, they all can speak any language that is shown on the computers, but they want to choose the language that will match as many opponents as possible. Everybody wants to match as many opponents as possible. And the equilibrium I'm going to look at is the natural equilibrium where they all choose English. All choose English as equilibrium because nobody can defect and do any better. But now going into this idea of group defection, <coughs> my students who was concerned, what if not all my opponent do what I say, what I what what the equilibrium say doesn't have to be concerned. I say to him, choose English because everybody is choosing English. He says, what if five people do not choose English? I tell him, you're still best off choosing English. So English is the best reply for you, no matter how many people defect and what they defect to. And actually anything up to a half of, anything up to a hundred million people can defect before you have an incentive to not choose English. It's very sustainable. If a million people started speaking Hebrew, you're still better off choosing English if you want to maximize the number of people you can, you can reach. So this is a very sustainable equilibrium. It sustains a hundred million defectors. Let me show you an example which is not like that. And the question is to mask, put a mask on or not. And there are 200 million potential players. Each can mask or not mask. And let's put some artificial cost. This is going to be very highly simplified. Let's say the cost of putting on a mask is one. The cost of living through an epidemic is 10. And I'm going to assume that any player not masking will bring about epidemic. If I push this extreme examples to, to payoffs, then payoffs are like this. If you don't mask, you'll bring about an epidemic. Your payoff will be minus 10. You wouldn't pay the payoff, you will not pay the payoff of getting a mask or using a mask. If you do mask, your payoff will be minus one if all your op opponents mask, because then everybody mask and you just pay the cost of getting the mask. But if some of your opponents do not mask and you mask, then your payoff is minus 11. You will have to live through the epidemic and you'll have the cost of masking. Uh, is the game clear? So let's look at the equilibrium that everybody masks. Why is it an equilibrium? Everybody masks because if everybody masks but me, if I mask, I pay minus one. If I don't mask, it will be minus 10. So if, if everybody else masks, it pay me to mask. So it's an equilibrium for every player to mask if everybody else masks. But what if some other people don't mask? If I think that some other people are not going to mask, that my, then my best reply is actually not to mask because somebody else will already bring about the epidemic. Why should I waste 
my resources on masking. So if I think that somebody else is masking, then my best reply is not, is not clearly to mask. There may be situations where I would choose not to mask. So this best reply, the strong deterrence of defection that no longer holds if there is another possible defector. And I would say that my, the defection index of this equilibrium is one, or one defector can destroy the equilibrium. So this is an example of unsustainable equilibrium. And I can put it in a diagram, which I'll use to help me view these things, that uh, if I put a sustainability level, all speaking English is very sustainable against many defector. Everybody masking is sustainable, but only against a single defector. Let me now introduce the other the index, the F, and show you why this may help me to assess difficulty of formation. So let me go back to the language formation game to show difficult formation, but let me talk about still in the US, everybody choosing French. It's the same as everybody choosing English in terms of the game and the payoffs, but and the defection index is still 100 million. If the game was played, it'll be very sustainable. But to make it a dominant strategy for me to choose French in the morning, to make it a dominant strategy for me, I need to know that 100 million people chose French already. So the formation index is 100 million. And I would say that this is sustainable, but formation is difficult. It requires 100 million loyalists. So that's a how to form equilibrium. Let me contrast it with example of something which is easy to form, to form new communication device. Maybe think of Zoom before it was introduced. So there are 200 million people who have to subscribe or not. The subscription cost is 9.99. And you have to decide if you subscribe or not. Where your payoffs are, if you don't subscribe is zero, no gain, no loss. But if you subscribe, excuse me, if you subscribe, it's the number of other subscribers that you can talk to, minus the subscription cost of 9.99. So very simplified. Uh, what can I say now? If I don't subscribe, it's zero. If I subscribe, it's the number of other subscribers minus 9.99. So what do I need to break even? All I need to break even is 10 subscribers. Once 10 subscribers subscribed, subscribing is a dominant strategy, no matter what the other people decide about subscription or not. So all subscribe is a Nash equilibrium, but the formation index of this is only 10, as you can see here. And therefore the defection index by duality is 200 minus 10. So this equilibrium of subscribing or not to a new network it's easy to form. It takes only 10 people to get it started. And once it's formed, it's sustainable. Is everybody, any, any questions by anybody? Please, please jump in. So I'm gonna go back to this diagram and add here the formation difficulty. So now Zoom is easy to form. Remember the formation index goes down from zero to Zoom is easy to form. It's low on the formation axis. All French is significantly more difficult to form. It requires more people to commit to make me jump in. And now I'm going to fill in the rest of this table by the duality. So Zoom will be highly sustainable because the formation is low, the sustainability is high and all and the all mask was very low sustainability will be very hard to form. So I can easily say that this equilibria are low viability. They are hard to form and they are not sustainable even if formed. The equilibrium in the top layer, like the zoom example, they are easy to form and they are highly sustainable once they are formed. So I will say they are high viability equilibrium. The difficulty will be the in-between case, which are equilibrium that are hard to form, but highly sustainable if formed. So what can we say about this, right? So, well, one thing we can say that they are viable if already formed, right? Uh, because 
if the formation is not an issue because they already formed by historical or whatever reasons, now we can take, uh, be feel good about them because we know that they are sustainable. So for example, if I'm in the US where everybody uses English is already a formed equilibrium, uh, all English for tomorrow morning on the computer choice, language choice game will be viable. All French will not be viable. On the other hand, if I was in France, uh, all choosing French on their computers tomorrow morning will be viable equilibrium. All choosing English will not be a viable equilibrium. So there is a little of subjective, I'm saying at the top column of subjective viability, and this brings in other considerations that are not purely from the payoffs in the game. Let me now show you some real life kind of thing, observations. Uh, so let's look at the all choosing English in the US as an example. This is a highly sustainable and already formed. So we consider this viable. Uh, and all of us who taught game theory have taught many examples of the list I have before. All English is a Nash equilibrium. It's a very viable one. All Spanish is an equal viable equilibrium in Spain. All Mandarin is a viable equilibrium in in China, uh, all use dollars in the US is a viable equilibrium in the currency choice game in the US. All use euros in Europe is a viable equilibrium for currency choice game in Europe. All use the metric system very viable in Israel. All use the US measurement system is a lousy equilibrium, but it's very viable equilibrium here and so on, all use Facebook, all use Twitters, all subscribe to Zoom. These are all examples of such equilibrium. So when I say that there are many viable equilibria observed in social systems, this is my argument why it's said that. I want to show you that they are difficult in social system with unviable equilibrium, but this is more difficult because they are unviable, so we don't see them. So let me go to indirect evidence so those of you know the behavioral game theory literature know that many of these lectures start with the uh, beauty context game where the only equilibrium is for all the judges to submit zero and all the experiments in the lab and field experiments and game played on the London newspapers and the New York Times or whatever uh, all contradict the play of this Nash equilibrium where all the judges submit the zero score, but if you look at the terminology that I use here, the defection index of everybody submitting zero is only one. And because this is such a low viability, we should expect not to see it in experiments and so on. Uh, all reporting to work in a simple production line. Simple productions are low viability because if one person failed to work, then the rest of the line doesn't work. And if you work on incentive system, uh, you don't want to come to work at all. Uh, and this is uh, actually a nice paper by Mishina from the Harvard Business School that shows how Toyota Motor Company de designed their production line not to be a simple production line that is subject to this la la lack of sustainability. Uh, I will do, do some example later that shows that cent centralized trade and centralized communication doesn't work well, because it all depends on the performance of one central player. Uh, mixed strategy equilibria are typically not, not viable uh, for most Nash equilibrium. And you can see a paper by Barry O'Neill from 1987 and follow-up literature that did experiments on the use of mixed strategies, uh, mixed strategies in real life experiments. There are some interesting about tennis where this is, is played zero sum game. Maybe there are more, it's a different notion of viability, but anyhow, an example of this is if you think of the language choice game again, and if you think that everybody flips a coin 50, 50 between English and French, if everybody flips a coin 50, 50 between English and French, it's optimal for me to flip a coin 50, 50 between English and French. But if somebody changes his coin to 80 to 20 between English and French, now nobody is best replying by switch, flipping 50-50 between the two. So this is very sensitive to defection. 
So mixed strategy equilibria are often not the, have a low D index. I'll do an example with the no confess in the confession game. Uh, and this reminds us of no disclosure agreements in bio and high tech company because without such agreements, the no confession equilibrium or no disclosure information a equilibrium is highly non-viable. Let me show you a game with incomplete information. And actually it kind of sheds some light on political issues. Uh, let me, why members of the same political party repeat the same talking points again and again on the Sunday morning shows here in the US. So let me, this is gonna be a standard sig two, two state stand signaling games. There'll be two states, I'll call them alpha and beta. There'll be decision makers who will have to choose actions, alpha or beta. Alpha is the good one. If alpha is the state, beta is the better one. If beta is the state, but there'll be recommend recommenders who know the real state and they will recommend to play alpha or beta. So alpha or beta are states, possible actions and possible recommendations. There'll be a thousand decision makers who have to decide which action to choose but their choice will be based on the recommendation, recommenders. Uh, and the recommenders are a certain types. Two of them are honest and one malicious. So there is a majority of the honest ones. The recommenders, as I said, know the true state, alpha or beta, and each can recommend one of the two actions, alpha or beta. The decision makers are told what is the majority recommendation, and then they choose their action, alpha or beta. And the payoffs are, as I'm suggesting, the decision makers want to choose the right actions. They look at the number of players who, whose action correspond to the real theta. The malicious, the honest recommenders want to encourage this, but the malicious recommender, he's trying to have as many people choose actions, which is not the real theta. Okay, so that's very quickly a signaling game, two-state signaling game with two types of recommenders. And the equilibrium, the honest recommenders tell the truth, the malicious recommenders lie, and the decision makers follow the majority recommendation. Um, and, but I'm saying that the index of defection here is only one. Why is the index of defection only one? Because if one of the honest recommenders for some reason is bribed or is confused or for whatever reason, he says the wrong thing, now the majority recommendation is the wrong theta. And under these conditions, the decision makers would not want to follow the majority. So this equilibrium can be destroyed by a defection of one player, in this case, an honest recommender. Okay, so it's very, it's not very sustainable. It depends on the accuracy of all the honest recommenders. But I wanna take two more points from here that I find interesting. Why does the malicious recommenders recommend the wrong theta? It doesn't matter, the equilibrium is going against him. They are going to choose the right theta. If he said the right theta, if, it, if the malicious recommender said the right theta, it will still be the wrong thing, but there is a new aspect to it. Uh, the defection index now will go up to two. He would make now the equilibrium more sustainable because it will take mistakes or defections of two players to destroy the best response property of this equilibrium. So what do we see? So there is an incentive for the mal malicious player to say the wrong theta, even though it doesn't make any difference. If he cares about the sustainability of this equilibrium that he doesn't like. Similarly, if the number of honest recommenders was increased to four, the sustainability of the equilibrium will increase to two because now you need the, defec the defection of more honest recommenders. So what's interesting is that whether I look at the original game or the two modifications, they all have the same, same outcome, same information structures, but they have different Ds 
and apparently players care about the and strategize with them. So if you look at political parties in the US, if I look at my Sunday morning shows where the parties keep sending their politicians to talk to the audience, they all repeat the same points and say the same thing. This is like having more recommenders with your message. Uh, why do loser voters vote? That's the question, why do people vote to start with? But people who know that their party is going to lose, why do they vote like this malicious recommender? Well, they decrease the viability of a bad equilibrium if they vote against the outcome that is going to be sustained. Okay, let me now show you what, how is this different from standard game theory? That's important. So let me look at comparison with game theory refinement. And let me first use what I call a confession game. So in this game, there are 36 criminal crime participants who committed a crime and they are interrogate, interrogated in 36 different room and the police is trying to get them to confess. Each player has to decide to confess or not, but in somewhat similar, not the same, but somewhat similar to the prisoner's dilemma, the police makes a deal with them. So first, if nobody confesses, the police is gonna to have to let them all go free. But if some confess, the understanding is that each one of these crime committed players will get 10 years in jail, but people who chose to confess will be rewarded by having his sentence reduced to only three years in jail. I hope it's clear. Okay. So if, if nobody confess or, or go free, if some confess, the, con the non-confessors get 10, the confessors get only three. Equilibrium, nobody confesses. Easy to see that this is in equilibrium. Why is that? Because if nobody confesses, if I confess, if I, if I don't confess, I go free. If I confess, I'll get three years. So why would I want to confess? So nobody confesses is in equilibrium, but I say that the defection index of this is only one. Let's look at this in some more details. So let me first look at refinements. If you look at the utility space of this game, doing it only for two players, but it's gonna be exactly the same utility space for more than two players. In this space, the no confession equilibrium, the payoff is zero, zero. Whereas anybody confessing or randomly confessing or anybody defecting from no confession will move the payoff to the gray area. He and everybody else in the game would lose. Any defect deviation from no confession, he and everybody in the game would lose. Uh, this is a very convincing equilibrium. And if you check, it's perfect, proper, strong, Nash. It's even coalition proof since we are talking about defections by coalitions. And since I see in, the, in my slide, boy, Sylvan and Auman, uh, <laughs> let me say in their wonderful paper that they started game theory, they said about this kind of an equilibrium, this is the undisputed outcome of such a game and they used it for their learning paper to say, if learning theory should work, it should learn to play this, this kind of equilibrium, NC equilibrium, because there's no conflict about uh, how to compromise, what to compromise, all stability, defections is a loss. It's a very convincing equilibrium. Well, here comes some new thinking. Uh, if I bring in the mafia, they would say about this, if the mafia send these people to commit the crime, they are very concerned. They say somebody will confess if just for the fear that others would, right? Because if I'm concerned that among these 36 people, somebody else will confess, I'm better off jumping in and confessing also because then I reduce my sentence from 10 years to three years. Then they also mumble, if we kill confessors, we'll change the rules of the games. And now no confession will be a dominant strategy. But without this killing, it's a non-reliable equilibrium. So what I want to say at the bottom of this slide is that this pass, this, despite passing the game theory refinements, the, the sustainability of this equilibrium is only one. NC is barely sustainable even though it passes all these wonderful game theory properties, 
So in that sense, I mean that it sheds some new light that was not captured by game theory refinements. Let me now contrast it with something else that comes up when I talk about this idea, and that is contrast it with stochastic stability. And let me look at the specific game. Here is the game. There is a boss, one player, big player, and n different subordinates. I have the same picture, but there should be different people. I just did, was too lazy. To. So there's a boss and n subordinate. Each has to choose a language again. And the boss payoff is very simple. He gets one if he chooses English, he gets zero otherwise. So he's a dominant, strictly dominant strategy to choose English. Each subordinate's payoff is one if she matches the boss's choice, zero if she doesn't match the boss. There's very natural equilibrium here, if you thought about it. Uh, everybody chooses English. Why? It's a dominant strategy for the boss to choose English and they all want to, they have a strict best reply to this, is to choose English. And if you check with the Young, the Kanduri, Melath and Rob, and other basin of attraction argument, this equilibrium is stochastically stable. But I want to show that there is a concern here and I want to say that the dominance, the defection index is only one, is only one why is that? So the subordinates all depend on the choice of one player B, and that's why they choose English because they know that he prefers English and they know that he's rational and therefore he's going to choose English. So they choose English because he convinced them, if you're familiar with US politics, that he's a st stable genius and he would do the best for himself. On the other hand, this one player is going around and bragging to people, I'm unpredictable. So now everybody depends on this one player and if this one player defects, he, he destroys the equilibrium. So the defection index is only one in this game. So this is a different kind of concern that is important. Oops. And what you can do if you wanted to improve this situation, suppose I replace the, replace the boss by a committee of three players, three bosses, all preferring English as the one did, and then subordinates who want to match the majority, the most bosses. So it's a different variation. And now you can see that the defection index goes to two because if one of the bosses goes crazy, uh, the other two are still there and they don't destroy the best reply property. You need to have two of the bosses defect. So with a committee of three bosses, things become more sustainable. Uh, and we see, for example, at Kellogg, the evaluation committees are done, the evaluation, research evaluation and promotions are done by committees, not by deans. And partly to not rely on the judgment of a single person, but the committee may be more sustainable in that. Uh, somebody, I, I learned something about the cultural revolution in China, when it ended, they didn't want to put Chiang Kai-shek in charge, they put a Politburo, and that's a similar kind of phenomena because it's controlled by more people. And the arguments then were similar to <clears throat> the argument I make here, that if you all depend on, China, on one, one dictator, it may not be as stable. Okay, let me a few more minutes, let me show you some coalitional defections. So here's a nice example to illustrate this point. Suppose I have eight players, they each have to go from point A to point B. They each have two choices. They can each take a taxi that will call the, cost them $80, or they can share the ride on the bus. The bus will cost 180, but the cost will be shared by all of the people who chose the bus. So one person going on the bus is bad, cost him 180, but two people is still bad, cost them 90. Three people going on the bus is already a saving, they will each pay $60 and so on. So everybody taking the taxi is a Nash equilibrium <clears throat> because one person defection doesn't pay. <clears throat> Defecting by myself, I will pay 180. So it's a Nash equilibrium. But I say that the defection index of this is two and I want to show you that the defection index should go down naturally maybe, 
as you change the taxi cost. If the taxi was free, then everybody on the taxi will be a dominant strategy, <coughs> strategy and ev everybody on the taxi will have a deter defection index of eight. If the ca taxi costs more than the bus alone, more than 180, then the, it have zero stability, sustainability property. But the point is that as we vary the cost of the taxi, we will see all the various levels of the index changing. But let me spend a little time on it. Why is it too? First, it's very easy to see why the defection index of everybody on the taxi, taxi when it costs $80, is deters two players defection. Any two players who defect are sure to lose. It deters strongly two players defection because if two, if Sylvan and I decide to go, sorry Sylvan, you're on my screen and, you, and I like to see you too. So. <laughs> if two, if two, if Sylvan and I decide to go on the bus, we are both smart and we say, well, look, now it's going to cost us each $90. So I don't care what Sylvan wants to do or not. If he comes on the bus or not, it's going to cost me $90 or more. Or, or more. So it's going to be more costly than staying in the taxi. So two player defection doesn't pay. But three player defection, I'll bring in Alman because he's on my screen. So if Sylvan, Bob, Alman and I decide to go on the bus, now there is a postal improvement because now we would each pay $60. So we deter two players defection, but we don't deter, the, the taxi doesn't deter, all taxi does not deter three players defection. So that's why I say that it's two. And you can see in the right hand side column that if we vary the cost, because of the taxi, we get all defection levels. Uh, what I wanted to take from this, this is nothing fan fantasy. These are very rational. I'm not dealing with some kind of crazy things. These are very rational incentives to defect. Moreover, they are simple enough for bus riders to go through. I remember doing this myself and I look at somebody in the line and say, let's go together to do this or that. And we save money. So this is things, kids can do that. Also politicians, when I wrote the paper the first time, it was during the Kavanaugh hearing, and this particular three senators wanted to defect from the right wing vote of supporting Kavanaugh to defect together. They didn't, they needed more than three apparently. But I wanna take the bus example to show you why the formation index, show you again why the formation index is important. So let's look at like a switch from everybody on the taxi to everybody on the bus. So we're staying with the same game. Formation index of everybody on the bus is two. If two people were on the bus, now it's a dominant strategy for everybody else to join. That's the meaning of the formation index being two. If two people are, have signed up to the bus, now it's a dominant strategy for everybody else to join. So this small value of two makes it likely to cause a switch to the bus. Why? The bus company, for example, could say, any, the first two people who choose the bus, we guarantee we will not charge you more than $75 each. So now it's less than the taxi, which is 80. So Silvan and I say, look at each other and say, oh, let's go on the bus. We won't pay more than 75. But once the two of us are on the bus, then everybody wants to join the bus because now it's a dominant strategy for everybody and everybody will be on the bus and the cost will be $22.5 per rider. The bus company didn't have to put out any money. Uh, everybody saved money, but this switch took place because it was easy, because all you needed to recruit is one other player. If you needed to recruit uh, seven other players that may not be so easy. Also, you don't really need the bus company to come in. You can say, suppose Sylvan and I looked at each other and we didn't hear that the bus company guarantees the switch at the cost of 75. Because see through this and say, if the two of us go on the bus, everybody will follow and will pay 22 and a half dollars. So players on their own can create a switch in situations like this because they see that it's gonna be easy. On the other hand, if you thought that you need to drag along seven people with you, you may be less, uh, more reluctant to do that. So switching is easy, other switches are not. All switching to French tomorrow is not likely. Annoying example that I know well is that 
I, I was, when I moved from Israel to the US, I was very annoyed by the uh, US measurement systems. I kept hoping that they will come to their senses and switch to metric, but then I Googled it and there are a lot of acts and calls by Congress and the government to switch. It never happens because the switching cost, the formation cost is so high. You need to have a hundred million people starting to use metric to make it wealth dominant strategy. Uh, let me skip that. There is the analogy, the relationship to the implementation with call K faulty players of Elias. I'll be happy to come back if anybody would like me to take the time. There are very easy ways to compute sustainability in graph graph matching games. Let me not go through that. Let me just give you two graphs that illustrate the point. So imagine two villages with a thousand people. One is the complete graph where everybody trades with everybody. And the other village with the same number of people, everybody has to trade through a central a middleman. And the equilibrium is what uh, medium of exchange, which kind of money to use to trade. And let's say the equilibrium, everybody uses dollars in both equilibria. In the top equilibrium, it's very sustainable. It'll be about 500, half of the people. Whereas everybody going through a middleman will be very low sustainability because the middleman may fault and then nothing is reliable. And you can take the same lessons from here for political systems. We already talked about a dictator versus a free system. Communication systems typically do not want to go through one central player uh, it's better if they are spread over. The coronavirus now in the US have a huge discussion of supply chains that you don't want to have your supply chain depend on a small number of players or players, especially players that you don't have any influence on. Uh, and supply chains will be much better in a free system where everybody can supply to everybody than when you depend on one supplier. Let me say a few words about future research and then I'll finish. Uh, okay, so first one message I'm taking from this and I hope to encourage others is that I went here through two very simple theoretical indices, D and F, and convinced myself and hopefully you that these two simple indices play an important role in predicting observed strategic behavior. To me, this suggests that we can have an optimistic research agenda to develop game theory tools to predict and explain actual strategic behavior. Uh, we just have to put our minds to it. Some open problems. I'm trying without success so far to axiomatize DF and other indices. Uh, Nash existence theorem needs to be expanded because if uh, equilibrium with D equals one is not very reliable and we rely it in, on it in all kinds of economic applications. It'll be nice to know for which kind of games there is more general. There's room for more refined indices. I'll say a couple of words on this. And more about equilibrium formation. I stayed with very simple equilibrium, one shot, and maybe there is sequential and non-anonymous ones. So Nash expanded theorem, uh, says find sufficient conditions for a game to have equilibrium pi with d of pi greater than or equal to k for k equals two or more, more sustainable equilibrium. What kind of games admit more sustainable equilibrium? The paper by Abraham and Al has two examples of this type. And there is a wor Northwestern working paper by Dipanshu Vassal and Randall Berry some limitations of D where we need more work on, uh, but then this, these are limitations, as I said, shared with Nash, but these limitations are disturbing. So you may want to say, okay, I will not go with Nash, but I would like a bit. So take these two examples again, think of two villages with a thousand people in each and everybody, complete graph, everybody can com com communicate with everybody. On the left-hand side graph, Everybody can communicate with everybody, except there is one husband who all, only talks to his wife. Uh, 
the defection index on the left is only one because if this wife defects, then he's no longer best responding by choosing English. Whereas the defection index on the right, it's 500 because everybody is sustained by 500 players. So these have the same, these have different levels of sustainability, even though I would say substantively, the communication quality on the left is roughly as good as the one on the right. There is one out of the N players who depends on a single uh, player here. So maybe we need more continuity and some indices, I can suggest you some, that depends on the number of people who suffer from defections. Similarly, we need discontinuity. If you look at these two graphs, the defection index on both of them is one, suggesting that they are similar in terms of sustainability, but you can see that they should not be one in many applications, right? Because here, the equilibrium is destroyed by this one player defecting, but it destroys only this guy. Whereas here, its equilibrium is destroyed by the central player defecting, but his defection dis destroys everybody's best response. So why are the, do they have the same D value? So may maybe a more careful refinement, more careful indices of sustainability will make a difference between these two. Uh, and non-anonymous indices and others, for example, let me finish the one, let me finish with one example uh, of equilibrium formation. Equilibrium formation, the way I put it was very simple. One shot, whatever a group does, everybody has a dominant strategy to fall, come along. But I want to talk about sequential equilibrium formation. So let's go back to the example with the device, divisive equilibrium in the party line game. Uh, in which the three Democrats chose French and the five Republicans chose English. And remember, everybody wants to look as different as possible from the choices of the others. So the equilibrium was the three Democrats French, the five Re Republicans chose English. And here is if I can count on sequential equilibrium formation, rather the, the formation index of this game was six. But if I can do it sequentially, I can make it much more efficient. If I can convince two Democrats to choose uh, French, the fact that two Democrats choose French now will convince the Republicans to choose English because two of Democrats are committed to French. And once the five Republicans all choose English, this in turn will convince the remaining Democrat to choose French. So I could cleverly manipulate through a sequence of formation from group to group to get eventually to the equilibrium I want. And I can only have to, I may only have to convince two players instead of convin convincing the critical mass of six. Uh, and this is again, I'm getting back to politics in the United States. The genius of a dictator is the skill to generate, to navigate a sequence of formation processes that lead to an equilibrium which all the players obey their wishes. Okay, I'll stop here and be happy to take any questions on anything or the things I skipped. Thank you. Well, if no, nobody says anything right now, then maybe I could take Jorgen, up this. Yes. yes, if I can just mention something, a spontaneous reaction, just you, you, sure. this con continuity aspect. You had yes. these networks. Uh, what your criterion is that it's enough if there's one little hole in the bucket, so to speak. Uh, yes. It's a bit like min-max in that sense. It's, uh, uh, it's like Nash. Yeah but, it's, yeah, but you could also say it's like min-max because it's enough, you look at some kind, you know, something bad can happen. If you would instead take a more Bayesian, yes. you could say yes. that with some small probability epsilon, independently, maybe everybody got a defection uh, idea in his mind. Yes. Uh, and then if you take these two networks, in one of them, there were lots of people and only one yes. of the husbands, you know, didn't speak. So that's a very low probability he will get it. 
Yes. Uh, while if you have uh, you had a six in the circle and then one central guy, then it's one out of seven, right? Yes. So you, you could say it's one uh, the chance the risk is one out of seven that he will you know he will be hit yes. with this epsilon, something like that, some kind of yes. you know risk of could go, do some continuity work, right? Which because yeah. that's the, the intuition would be like that, right? It's very unlikely that. Yes. I don't know. I, I agree. I thought about it. But again, I wanted to stay, I agree, totally agree with you. I wanted to stay close to Nash at this level, but this would be much more indes interesting indices. Maybe some of them will tie nicely with evolutionary game theory, even though they caught, I had the example that showed that, but, uh, but these are very natural ways, some kind of probabilistic, some kind of a probabilistic defection, but I, I stayed away from probability, but probabilistic mm. defection and average defection, average, I, I agree with you totally. Average harm, yeah, yes. Okay, any more questions from anybody? I have, I have plenty of questions. Uh, thank you, Ewood. Uh, thank the, you, Silvan. Yes, I have plenty of questions, okay? So the first question will be the following. Uh, the number of people, it's very discontinuous. Okay? Yes. So you could think of uh, having a distance in the space of strategies. Okay? Yes. If you have N player, you put uh, the, the profile of strategy in a space and you look at the proximity when there is an, an alternative profile. And rather than having a, a discontinuous parameter like the number of people who are choosing, changing, you look at the distance and you will see whether it's robust to uh, some change in, in some distance, okay? Yes. yes. This would be an alternative, maybe more smooth. Uh, uh, yes. Well. And the second point is, uh, in terms of the property that you mentioned, uh, sometimes you justify the property by saying the player will choose this one because it's more uh, sustainable or more stable and so on. And in... Um, uh, somehow, I, I think you can also apply this concept in situations where people are, don't know that they are playing Nash Equilibria. And in most situations, yes. you simply don't know because you don't know the payoff of your opponents. So you have absolutely no way to see whether a profile is a, an equilibrium or not. Okay? Yes. Or to see whether the other player have some incentive to play the required strategy. Okay? Yes. 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 Nevertheless, the property of the profile is the same. Okay? Yes. So you, if you can use the same definition, for example, in biology or evolutionary game theory and so on and so forth, without assuming that the players know anything about the property of the Nash equilibria, and even yes. they don't know that they are playing a Nash equilibria. In most of the case, what is a Nash equilibria? It's a sequence of one person decision problem. You are given a vector of payoff and a recommendation. And it has to be that the recommendation gives you the highest uh, component of the vector. And that's all what you yes. know. Right. Okay. So I, I agree totally, yes. Maybe we should think about it as a focal point though. It's more, yes, more in, the, in this, uh, in, in, in this spirit uh, rather than, in, because you were using the, 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 the terminology prediction, okay? And yes. I, I, I don't think, I mean, if, if you start with the game and you try to predict which equilibria will be played, you need yes. much more information. First yes. of all, you need all the players to know what are the equilibria in the game. And usually yes. it's not the case, okay? And think, right. think of the simple cases of battle of sexes. There is no theory that will give you yeah. a question about which one will be played. Yeah, let, let me just, Sylvan, uh, ask you to separate. Are we talking about the the players, or are we talking about somebody who's trying to predict the behavior of the players? Uh, if by trying to predict the behavior of the player, you assume that they know more than they really know, uh, there is some contradiction there. Okay. If you say, yeah, I yeah, yeah. You want to predict that the player will play Pareto Optimal Nash, for example, uh, if they don't know, if they don't know that this uh, profile is actually Pareto Optimal, there is, there is an issue. 
yeah, I'm thinking of a, a game theorist trying to tell the government which equilibrium will be played in this game. So the game theorist, rightly or wrongly, or you may be right that it's wrongly, will start with the Nash equilibrium and test whether this Nash equilibrium that he's counting on, like in the implementation literature, can be counted on. So that's where he will, I'm, 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 I, I don't disagree with your points, I'm just trying to understand what is the process in which we choose strategies in a game? But a game theorists, I know how they choose. They go and they look for the Nash equilibrium. So they start at the Nash equilibrium, maybe wrongly. Uh, but I, 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 I agree. I mean, I, I think the, my reliance on that, I think I could have given the talk entirely in terms of talking about focal points that are sustainable or form or not, instead of talking about Nash equilibrium, I think I can run through the whole thing. I use the word Nash equilibrium because that's familiar to game theorists. But your point is right that it doesn't have to be the one that is focal in players' mind. Yeah. I'm sorry, I cut you off. I interrupted you. No, no, it's, it's, uh, it's okay. I mean, uh, because I, I, I start come back to my the first first reaction. I think that most game D of pi is one. Okay, because yes. if it's not one, it means that in the neighborhood of one equilibrium, you have plenty of other equilibrium, for sure. Because you can allow one player if D if D of pi is two, you can allow one player to change his strategy still on equilibrium. Okay, so you have a whole neighborhood. I mean, your equilibrium is not isolated at all, for sure. Okay? I say the last sentence again, sorry. If D of, if D of pi is greater than, strictly greater than one, it means yes. that the equilibrium pi is not isolated. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's an it's indif indifference there, yeah. Yes, and generically it, it there. So, uh, I, I think that yeah, the, the concept is, is really uh, interesting in, in the class of game you were mentioning, where the equilibrium is more like uh, a mean of communication, like money or language or uh, the, the, your graph example are, are perfectly well. These are situations where there's a lot of, of common uh, interest among the players. Okay, they yes. both are they're more or less in symmetric situation, more or less yes. the same test, more or less the same outcome, and so on. Okay, in this case. Right. I think it makes sense. But in the yes. general game, uh, you need much, usually, uh, since you have absolutely no information about the payoff of your opponent, you cannot make any uh, uh, <clears throat> assumption or, you, you know, even in terms of pl plausibility of, of, of deviation or whether the, you know, there is this paper by Bob about uh, uh, the Nash equilibria that are not enforceable. Okay? Yes. So this, you have to know the payoff of your opponent. Yes. Okay? There is a very nice uh, example by Rida also in a game where one player is a dummy player. Yes. But if you know the payoff of the opponent, there are Nash equilibria that are not, not, uh, not, not, not su sustainable at all. But you have to know, even if you are a dummy player, the payoff yes. of your opponent to play this. Okay? Yes. Yes. And in, in, in Nash theory, yeah, uh, this is not. I mean, uh, this is an assumption that you don't need to define uh, equilibrium or, uh, or stability of equilibrium. Never. Yeah, I I, I agree. I, I would like. I mean, just a minor, very minor correction, which is not in disagreement. I'm sure you. Uh, in the divisive game, we don't have the common interest. We have opposite interests. Yeah. I just want to mismatch as many Republicans yeah, 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 as yeah, yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. But it's the same flavor. Sure, sure, sure. Of a uh, unison of opinions. Uh, and it would be very interesting to see a theory like that. I, I just wanted to start with two indices that will start a discussion of improvements of the ones suggested here. I'd love to see this. Merrily, were you saying something? No. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> May I? I 
Super, perfect. Are there any Hello? more questions? Yeah, uh, I was wondering, um, what is the connection with the following idea, which looks kind of similar, but I'm not sure if it is the same or not. So, suppose I'm uh, one of those players, and instead of taking my payoff against uh, all the sets of n players, according to the pi strategy, I look at the worst case utility, assuming that three players will deviate. So I yes. go back to standard Nash equilibrium concept, yes. but by changing just the payoff to the worst case yes. out of three deviations. Would yes. this be a mean to prove the existence, let's say, of a three stable equilibrium? Oh, to prove the existence of that. Wow. I never, I didn't think about that. Uh, I don't know. I didn't think about it. That'll be a good, that'll be a fresh attempt to do that. I don't know. It satisfies the, the condition satisfies, what is it called? Strategic invariant? Is that what it's called? That, you know, if you change the strategies without changing the best response strategy? Yeah. Uh, this, it satisfies this condition of strategic invariance, these notions I'm discussing. And I'm not sure that what you are suggesting satisfies that. If it still can somehow give me sufficient conditions for existence, that will be very interesting. I, I don't know. Thanks. I'd love to see anybody doing anything with that because I'm, I'm giving up. <laughs> I've been, this is very simple stuff, but I spend a huge amount of time on it. So I'm kind of like to see any help I can get with any of these questions. Uh, the reason, by the way, with the Sylvan suggestions and the Jorgen suggestions before that of alternative indices, I think they are very important and appealing, uh, but we have to depart from Nash, therefore, and it's not easy to depart from Nash. I mean, Nash is everywhere but uh, they would require similar kind of improvements in Nash equilibria, right? I mean, Nash, yeah, so anything along these lines will be, uh, the reason I didn't want to do it in this paper is because I, I didn't want to write a paper that will be, you know, I didn't want to go the refinement literature route. Nash started with Nash equilibrium and then all these refinements came and the refinements fell apart, but Nash equilibrium stayed. Uh, I think the same thing is here. Fear of objection, fear of defections by opponents is a real thing. Opponents, so when, Sylvan may not call it Nash, and I agree, maybe oh, defection from a convention. There's a convention, everybody speaks English. Call it Nash equilibrium or not, it's a convention, focal point convention or whatever that uh, people defect, I don't care. Uh, other conventions are more sensitive to this. But if you start immediately from this type of concepts, then you can write 20 different papers right away, each one capturing different ideas, where this one staying near Nash is central. But I think now it would be very nice to see competing better ideas along the lines that were mentioned. Are there uh, any more questions? Eud. Yes, I, I, I was not asking question because I, I don't remember what I asked when you talked in Jerusalem. So I am almost sure that if I ask a question, it will be repetition. But yes. maybe for the audience, I will share Sure. Uh, my, my general view about the issue of Nash equilibrium and resentance or non-resentance to the issue of Nash in applications. Yes. So I think in the practical world, something that is much more bothering uh, decision makers in looking for the Nash equilibrium 
yes. is the issue that in the Nash equilibrium, you are building on exact optimization. And yes. many of those decision makers, in real practical decisions, they would prefer maybe not to maximize completely, but to be in an area such that if some of their parameters are not guessed correctly, and if they have some errors, and these errors could be on others' behavior, on the description of the game, on the information, and so on, that they will be close to an optimal behavior in the sense of the payoff, but more they do care of robustness to such changes. And what you are basically looking here is on one type of this robustness of yes. the other players moving. Yes. I, 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 I agree. There are, I, so, you know, one of the things that people ask me in earlier presentations is, so which equilibrium you select? My idea is not which equilibrium, it's refinements typically say which is equilibrium survive the refinement and which not. I, I do not question the idea that there'll be game that no Nash will be played or various other options. But there are games where it is Nash. For example, the Zoom, everybody joining Zoom is a very convincing equilibrium to me. And it's very practical to compute for an entrepreneur who invented Zoom and tell him, if you charge 9.99, you will need 10 people to form this equilibrium where everybody joins or call it something else. You will bring about everybody to join. But if you, ch if you charge 99.99, 99.99, you would need 100 people to join, to make everybody join. So this is very practical. I don't know if to call it, equi I, I, you're, you're doubting me whether I can use the word equilibrium or not between Sylvan comments and yours. Uh, and of course, we should look for alternatives. I agree, we should look for alternatives, uh, especially when there are games where there are no good equilibrium. <laughs> so, I don't know, yeah. Thank you, very good comments, yes. Okay, thank you, Ayod. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming and for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Ayod. Thank you. Thank you, the organizers, for organizing this. There, there were some questions on the chat, by the way. Maybe you can oh. take them off offline. Shall I look in the chat? What do I do with this? You can Where's the chat? I stop share, maybe that will help. Oh, there. Where is the chat? Oh, here I see ch oh, six questions on the chat. From Galit to everyone, please feel free to come. Okay, and I'll ask from Rida, perhaps for existence, one can first restrict attention to anonymous game. Yes. Yes. So I mentioned, Rida, I mentioned this discussion paper at Northwestern, which is not published yet or ready yet but it does look at what I call semi-anonymous games in my large games paper. And it starts some sufficient conditions on that. Mm -hmm. So, so your, your guess is in accordance with others. Uh, it said six, I don't see six, okay. Is that, did I answer all the questions on the chat? Extensive form games. <laughs> oh, that's a extensive form. That's a that's the next step, and that's very extensive form. And actually, the one example I had with the signaling game is a little extensive form, right? Because the recommenders move first, nature move first, then the recommenders, then that. But I purposely did not go there because you have to now take positions because there'll be some modeling choices to be made. Uh, agent formal, agent no, agent extensive form, or a just normal form, normal extensive form. One has to think through the various examples of the, you know, the ramifications of these various choices. So that's in Bayesian games, and of course all that. I suspect that Bayesian games in general 
will be highly non-sustainable because just the mixed strategy equilibrium is typically unsustainable. So Bayesian where you have so now it's a question in a Bayesian game, do you take nature as a bunch of people generating information and probabilities or do I take nature as fixed? So I don't know if to take uncertainty about parameters outside the game or, or parameters that are hard, not generated by players, but by other, like flipping a coin. Should the coin be a player and it wants to fall heads or tails and, and it chooses 50-50 or should that coin? So there are a lot of conceptual issues here, a lot of very interesting conceptual issues. So that's, it's a long answer to your point about extensive games, but uh, very interesting. Okay, thank you again, Ehud. Thank you all. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, Shmuel. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye